Thank you, Karen. We're going to wrap up our service today with that song, so that's a good fitting intro for us. Today is, I just want to give you a preview of where we're headed for the next couple weeks. Uh, today is freedom, liberty. We'll talk about that. I'm kind of going to wrap up. I'll tell you a little bit of the history about why we've been talking about Juneteenth and we had our special speakers. I'll get into a little bit of that this morning. And that'll be today. Then we'll finish First Timothy next week. And then the week after that, we will dive into that series, Hath God Said, and, and spend the rest of the summer in questions and things like that. Uh, and then after that, I'm not really sure where we're going to go. But uh, I know that we will have uh, communion the last Sunday of this month uh, and probably also do a carry-in as well. But uh, let's just stay tuned and we'll let you know about that. Sometimes I have uh, messages that, had, that are on my heart and mind for more than a year. Uh, th today is one of those. Um, I had originally planned to give it on Juneteenth, which you've heard me talk about over and over. And we had our brothers Bob Smith and Levi come and share their, their experiences. You've heard me talk about it a lot lately, so I promise you, after today, I won't talk about it again for a while. Uh, but let, let me give you a little background about that. There's sometimes when I have these things in my, uh, my mind for a year, I get a lot of material. So I probably did more editing and cutting out today than I've done in a long time. Um, but I thought I was going to be here on Juneteenth to give it. Then I found out I was going to be gone. So we had those guys come and share. Uh, I watched uh, the recording, and I was here for uh, Levi's. Uh, and I appreciate their willingness to come. Um, but I also noted uh, their deference or hesitation to be as bold as I would have wanted them to be. But I also understand that if I was filling another pastor's pulpit, I may be a little hesitant to say things that uh, probably would be difficult for some audiences to hear. Uh, what I, if you do, if you were not here, what I want you to remember uh, or watch on the video is when Levi was, who's grown up in New Haven, was sharing his, about his experience of about dating, actually a pastor's daughter here in New Haven, a white woman. He was moved to tears by that experience that happened to him as a 15-year-old kid. Uh, and if you didn't hear him share that story, go ahead and, and look that up. It was very powerful uh, and I'm glad he shared that with us. But anyway, so this is a message that as I asked those guys to come, I wanted them to kind of say all the things that as a white male American I couldn't say, but I'm going to have to say it anyway. Um, because as, my, as pastor of this church, that's my role. Um, but I did want you to hear uh, their content and their stories as well. So that I'm glad that uh, you're here today. We can hear from the Lord and his word. Uh, before we do that, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for um, the power, the truth, the light, and the hope that your word brings. We pray as we uh, dig into that this morning. Um, that we can hear truly what you have to say to us. Um, we are overwhelmed during the week from outside sources of information, of viewpoints, of commentary, of so many different things. Lord, we want to be discipled not by that, but by your word. And we come this morning with open ears and eyes expecting to hear what you are saying to us. And Lord, use me to speak to your people, challenge us through your word, um, and may we be encouraged uh, and, and leave here being closer in our walk with you and more Christ-like as we are in the world. And God's people said, amen. So we often take breaks because, you know, I like to do long series. Sometimes we'll do a whole book. This summer we're doing that whole Hath God Said series. And I like to, for me, it gives me a place to know where I'm going the next week. But we'll often take breaks for Mother's Day, Father's Day, you know, and I'll preach specifically about that. A lot of times we'll have visitors that come on those days and it's like they came because it's Mother's Day for a long time I fought against that but then it's like oh, just you know if that's what they're here for give the people what they want right uh, and obviously we do a Christmas series every year well often on the closest Sunday to 4th of July I would do a patriotic series I went back to look to see how often I've done that um, today's the third so obviously this would be the day for that last year I did a, a message titled let freedom ring um, two years ago, then 2020, it was with Liberty and Justice for All. This was in the midst of the racial protests. I was probably hitting a similar theme that I'm going to hit today. Uh, in 18, in 2018, 2016, 2010, I'm sure there was a long time where I ignored that as well. But it's not that I'm un-American or unpatriotic. It's just in this room, I'm more concerned that our exaltation and our worship is not of a country or a leader, but of a savior and a king. And God's people said... And you may say that I'm too far biased that way, but you've probably seen churches, you may have been a part of one, 
Uh, we're all wearing red, white, and blue today. I had my red shirt on, but then I heard that Karen and Chris were wearing theirs, so I went and changed. Uh, Creighton's got stars on his, right? You're, we're wearing red, white, and blue because we are Americans, and we're proud of that. You may have been a part of a church that, as you came in, had flags lining the driveway, and there'll be a lot of churches that celebrate, and they sing the Star Spangled Banner and all sorts of those things today. You know me well enough that I'm going to tell you that's not what we're here to glorify today. Uh, as much as proud as we should be of our country, we should be even more grateful and humbled by our Savior and King. So it's been the culture of this church for a long time that we're willing to celebrate Independence Day. I preach sermons. Karen plays patriotic songs. We often do what we're doing today. Uh, we have multiple flags in the room, which take a good look because they will not be here next week. Um, that's okay. It's okay for us to take breaks and celebrate those things. And you also know that, I've, as I said before, I've become less enthusiastic about pro-America. Not because of my attitude about America has changed, just because I realize that my priority as a servant of the king is to draw people into his presence. And sometimes people don't love America as much as others. And if my love for America distracts from people loving the cross, then I need to remove it out of the way. It's a stumbling block to others. And Paul talks about that a lot. We're not getting into that today, but I'm just kind of rehashing my philosophy. You guys know this, right? How I feel about all this, that when we're in this room, God rules and reigns over all. And country can fall way down the list for, for my concern. So I'm not telling you anything new, but if somebody's watching this on recording, this is, this is where we are. I believe this, the church should be a place where any people and every person can come and worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, not just an American patriot. Uh, and last year, like I said, I preached a message titled, Let Freedom Ring. So I went back and I read it this morning. The theme was basically spiritual freedom. Now, I, I want to be honest with you. I probably have not told you this. You've probably noticed. A lot of times, and this is sometimes for my own enjoyment, I will give a message, a title that is really an enticement to get you to come and listen. Uh, and on the 4th of July last year, I preached Let Freedom Ring, and it was really about spiritual freedom in Christ. It wasn't about uh, God bless America and all those sorts of things. Uh, so now that I've given my secrets away, you're, you're completely uninterested in whatever the summer series is going to be. Uh, to be honest, I do it for myself sometimes because I, I enjoy words and phrases and those sorts of things, and it keeps me interested and excited about what we're doing. But anyway, last year, the freedom was the, the freedom that Christ brings. Uh, and we know that... Uh, uh, again, that Jesus came to save sinners, not just Americans. Uh, I read a quote, um, let's see, this would have been May 31st. I have, by the way, you're going to want to read the notes. There is a ton of websites, articles, and links that went into today that I'm not using, pictures even. Um, so this is, this is one of them that you'll see in the notes. Uh, a guy tweeted at the end of May, says, We are reaping what we've sowed for, talking about the church, we're reaping what we've sowed for generations, seeing white as American and American as Christian. So that's kind of what I want to deal with and talk about for us today. Today I want to preach Let Freedom Ring Part 2, not knowing that last year was Let Freedom Ring Part 1. Um, so we want to celebrate Independence Day as Americans, um, but we have not become aware of this whole word of Juneteenth, and you're probably tired of hearing me say it, until fairly recently. Some might say, well, why should we celebrate that? If we don't celebrate white independence, and I would say... We don't. July 4th, every year, is basically our version of Independence Day, right? June 19th is the African-American black, formerly enslaved people's version of Independence Day. So I want to suggest this morning, and I'm not going to be too, too vague about it, that we should celebrate with them. Now, I'm not going to bring it into part of the service just the way I feel about American Independence Day, I'd feel the same way about Juneteenth. It's secondary to God being King and Lord. But I want us to, to rethink this idea about how maybe someone with a different perspective than ours might think about their own independence. I want to give you some history to back that up in a little bit this morning. Uh, some churches, and I'm not sure I'm this far yet, uh, but churches within 10 miles of us have been taking February, you know, as Black History Month. Well, I know of some churches that have been celebrating Black History Month. And at first my thought was, why would we do that, right? This was my background, and maybe that's still your thoughts too. And their response, as I've actually had this conversation with Bob, who's probably one of those people, their response would be, well, we celebrate White History Month every other month because history has been recorded. You, you've heard the phrase, history is recorded by the victors or the triumphant. I want to suggest to us this morning that this is true not only for me, but for all of us, that our version of American history, I don't want to use the word 
whitewashed, but that's the word that popped into my mind there, has been told by those who were triumphant, those who got to decide how history was told. And I want to give us a couple things this morning that you were probably unaware of, as even as a, a history buff, I was unaware of until recently. Uh, and as I thought about this more and more, this idea of Juneteenth, and I had conversations with uh, Bob and Levi in particular, I realized that there are brothers and sisters in Christ. Why can't we celebrate with them? Now, I don't think either of them goes overboard with celebrating in their, in their congregations. But I thought, why can't we celebrate with them? We should celebrate liberty and independence for a group of people. We should celebrate that with anybody who's a brother and sister in Christ, except for maybe criminals. We wouldn't want to celebrate their freedom and independence. But Romans 12, 15, this verse came to my mind. We should celebrate a lot of things together. Romans 12, 15 says, Rejoice with those who rejoice, mourn with those who mourn. Is this not what we do as a church with each other when someone in our church is experiencing a loss or a hardship? We, sometimes we legitimately feel that suffering and that compassion with them. Because that's a scriptural principle. It's, what's the, it's the purpose of the body of Christ for us to gather around. Remember the, the, the verse, I think it's in Corinthians, about the God of all comfort. Give us that comfort to comfort others, those who are around us. I, I wish I had the reference in my head, but I can't. But that's what Paul is saying here in Romans, that not only when we mourn with those who mourn, but we rejoice with those who rejoice. When someone has a baby or something, we rejoice with them, right? Because we are part of that family, that body of Christ. You've probably heard over the last few weeks uh, some things that have challenged our ideas and our experiences of freedom in America. Uh, hopefully Bob's experiences and Levi, Bob didn't have so many that he did not share with you. Uh, I can still remember many years ago, probably more than 10 years ago, uh, I think Bob was not even the, the pastor at Harvester at the time. Uh, we had had a, an incident where uh, it was racial profiling or something, and I can't remember if, if the young man was shot and killed or not, but I said to Bob, I said, I have a hard time, Bob, help me understand this. Not being a black guy in America, do you really feel profiled by policemen or whatever? And Bob has got that big grin on his face. He goes, man, I can't begin to tell you how many stories. And that shocked me because I know Bob. I often call Bob the whitest black guy that I know because uh, he, he's so open about his, his, his experiences of America with me that I appreciate that because that's it's not the way I see things. But he goes, man, I couldn't even begin to tell you how many times I've been pulled over because I was black. And that's kind of what we heard about Levi when he was sharing here. And I don't think Bob shared that with you, but I feel free to tell that. And uh, anyway, anyway, let me remind you, if you didn't get a chance to see those, go back and look at those. But I've had meals and or very frank conversations with both of those guys about their experience of America. And I believe that they both know and they love Jesus most of all. And they're our brothers in Christ. Uh, and we need it and still need to hear their voices. So I asked them to come. Uh, and as I began to reflect back on how is... How has my leadership as pastor of this church been as we talk about racism? Are we clear on our position? And I think back, we've had Corey here with us a couple times and his sister Angela had come in and man, she laid it down. Go back to look at July of 2020, I think they were here. Angela flat out, his sister is really good, at really talented. I think it's probably still on our YouTube and Facebook pages. But go back and look at that. So I've tried to be as open as I can with having people of a different color or of a different race or even different language. Sometimes we even struggle to understand them come and fill this pulpit. So I wanted to slip into this morning, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time. I could really spend a lot of time being a history teacher. That's probably what I'd be doing if I wasn't doing this. Um, but I want to conclude with a passage from 1 Corinthians. But let me give you a little history as we read into that. Uh, and I've told you about this idea of victors write the history. Much of the history that you and I have been taught has celebrated what we celebrate, right? We celebrate the pilgrims and Plymouth Rock and the Protestants coming to America to, to have freedom of religion. Uh, we celebrate all the, we know all the presidents of America. We know all those sort of things. We all went through the same American history, political science, economics classes. So hopefully in the last two weeks you heard a different perspective of American history and Juneteenth would certainly be a part of that. It's not often in American history that we realize the mistakes that we have made until many years later. You don't have to do a lot of research to realize what we Americans did to the Native Americans. What, how we have promoted racism in our country. And there's so many things that we look back at now and regret. Uh, kind of a side branch. In Canada, you know what they call uh, the Native, not Native Americans, but Native Canadians. They call them, which I love, they call them First Nations. Which I thought was so cool. I'm like, 
Yeah, because they were there first. But we, we, have, we have moments in American history that we're not proud of, and we move on past Custer and the American Indian Wars because we don't want to talk about that because now we realize that that was a mistake. We have to re deal as followers of Christ, as people who are aware of our own sin, we have to deal with mistakes in our past. So the year 2020, you remember that, the pandemic started in March and then there was a summer of very much uh, racial protests and I think there was, had been a shooting at the time. Uh, and it brought attention to the racial issues that are still so prevalent, prevalent in our country. We just had a shooting in Ohio a few days ago. Uh, it seems that every few years racism pops up in our culture and it is our job as people of Christ to do our best to stand firm against it. I can remember protests when I was in college back in 1992. You remember the whole Rodney King in Los Angeles. Some of you probably remember the 1960 protests and the, the riots and the marches and all those sorts of things. So this weekend as we will we'll celebrate American freedom as we should, uh, and some of you have served in the armed forces and we thank you for that. We're thankful for your service that we have this freedom and privilege to do this. We do that on uh, uh, Memorial Day and Veterans Day also. But today I want to show you a few events in American history that you probably haven't heard of. And if you have, it's only been recently. They're not the more glamorous, heroic stories that pass through the pages of our history books. So I'm going to call it a history lesson, a history you haven't heard. Think about it this way. As you read your Old Testament and Scripture, do you realize that what, most of what you're reading is the history of Israel? I just read Psalm 78 this week, which is a long recounting of, history, of Israel's history of the times where they followed God, but then also the times where they didn't. And I think sometimes as America, we like to promote the good things, but not the bad things. Well, the scripture doesn't allow us to do that. The feasts in the Old Testament were reminders of God's faithfulness. It was a time of the year that set aside that Israel was to come and be reminded of God's faithfulness to him. Many passages recount, as I told you, of Psalm 78 to preserve that story, that history for the next generations. And those stories recount Israel's faithfulness and its heroic leaders, but also both the good and bad things. So here's a few notes from history. History you haven't heard. I had never heard most of these, and I had to verify them so that it wasn't just me finding a place on the internet to tell this story. So all these stories I'm about to tell you have been checked out historically. And most of our brothers and sisters can tell you these stories because they know them. How many of you have ever heard of Black Wall Street? Very few of us, right? This is in Tulsa, Oklahoma in 1921. A very prosperous black community was overrun and burnt down by a group of whites. It started about uh, in an elevator. A, a white girl said she had been assaulted by a black guy or something and then it just... The whole thing was destroyed. I think 10,000 people. I'm not going to tell you that. You can look at the links tomorrow. I'm not going to get into the story. But you have probably never heard about Black Wall Street. Look it up. It's part of American history. 1921, just over 100 years ago. You probably didn't hear about a bombing of a residential area in Philadelphia in 1985. I can't remember if it was the Army or police, but they literally bombed a residential area that had a group of... Uh, whatever their political views were, they didn't agree with them. They literally bombed it and let it burn down in 1985. We didn't hear those stories in our history books, did we? There have been countless shootings, as I mentioned the one in this week, name after name after name of incidents in our country where black unarmed people have been either pulled over or harassed or end up being shot multiple times. This kid in Ohio this week was shot 60 times. They shot at him 90 times. This is the news that we're on now. And I'm like, what is the point of shooting someone 60 times? It doesn't take that to subdue somebody. So there's always two sides to every story. That's our first reaction, right? When we hear a story, we're like, well, what did he do to get shot 60 times? I got to tell you, that's often been my reaction too. But that's not the scriptural reaction. Our biblical reaction should be to mourn with those who mourn. To rejoice with those who rejoice. We need to be able to hear the stories. For both these historical events and the shootings, we're likely to become defensive. And we try to justify or defend what happened or to blame those who were killed and say, well, why didn't they just surrender? Our response should be to listen to the pain and the sorrow that our brothers and sisters have endured. God's a God of justice and peace. And if we can't have justice, there won't be peace. 
This is where we struggle in our country. And I'm not trying to make a bold political statement here. You know that I, I don't like to do that. Or deal with issues called of reparations and all the things that, that maybe get thrown into this or get into finger pointing and blame. What I'm looking for and expect and ask the people of God is an ear to hear. A heart of compassion. Before we judge, before we become defensive, listen to the pain and the hurt that our brothers and sisters in Christ have to share with us. So that we'd have a desire to see all people united in Christ and willing to work together for the betterment of everybody in our country. Let freedom ring. We can't just say those words hollowly and expect it to just happen. So I skipped over some other examples. If you want to read the notes tomorrow, you can see some other ones. But there's one to me that is probably the most heartbreaking of all the history I discovered that I had never heard. And Harrison's got a couple of pictures to put on the screen. You likely have not heard of the slave Bible. And I want to read this because I looked it up to see if this was true. So as these pictures are on the screen, you've heard of the museum of the Bible that was recently finished and built in Washington, D.C. This Bible is in that museum. So in the museum of the Bible located in Washington, D.C., there is a popular exhibit known as the slave Bible. The fact that such a thing even exists should pierce your heart, but it gets worse. This English translation from the 1800s was specifically designed for the conversion of enslaved people to Christianity. But in order to protect the oppressive status quo, the power dynamics of the plantation, this version was heavily edited. The goal being to remove any reference that might incite revolution or awaken a longing for liberation. As you might expect, the end result was a Bible that we would hardly recognize. According to the guy who created the exhibit at the museum, there are 1,189 chapters in a standard Protestant Bible that you could pick out of the pew that you maybe brought with you this morning. 1,189 the slave Bible contains 232. 50% of the New Testament is missing. And 90% of the Old Testament. Think about the story of Israel rising from slavery in Egypt. God bringing them out to a promised land. Because across every page, that is a story that incites revolution and awakens this longing for liberation. So it was important that they didn't know that. Imagine reading a Bible that leaves out the account of the Israelites' freedom and exodus from Egypt. 90% of it is missing. What was the purpose of us editing the Bible? We wanted slaves to come to Jesus. We just didn't want them to come to freedom. We wanted them to remain slaves. That's a terrible part of our history, which I can admit I didn't even know until just recently in the past couple years. There's an interesting kind of parallel, but also an opposition to that, that when Juneteenth was originally celebrated, this was in Texas, I think Bob talked about it. It was originally called by those formerly enslaved people, it was called Jubilee Day. Do you know what the purpose of Jubilee is in scripture? Remember, it's the reference to the Old Testament practice that every 50th year, the land would lay fallow, allow to, to rest, and the slaves would be free. So when our American slaves who were recently freed realized that, they called it originally Jubilee Day, harking back to what they knew from Scripture, even though they didn't, we tried to hide it from them. Look in Leviticus 25.10, this is on the screen. God says, you are to consecrate the 50th year and proclaim freedom in the land for all its inhabitants. It will be your Jubilee when each of you is to return to his property and each of you to his clan. It's worth noting, there's a, in one of the links I'll send you tomorrow, I watched a kind of a video discussion that the first, talked about the first response to the announcement in Texas was that many slaves came together in church and worshipped, thanking God for their freedom, not thanking America or the soldiers or whatever, but thanking that ultimately their freedom came from God. So by all means, we should celebrate 4th of July, celebrate our freedom, but let's not forget that it's probably a white Independence Day. But as we celebrate that freedom and independence, let us contemplate what freedom means for all Americans. Remember the, the little title of the poem on the Statue of Liberty? The tired, poor, huddled masses yearning to breathe free. There's a whole other story that I cut out today. You can see that tomorrow as well in the notes. 
So we're not just celebrating liberty and freedom as white Americans, but rejoicing together as all nations and all peoples in a spiritual celebration. We often tout the fact that we live in a broken and fallen world, right? When somebody asks us, well, why does God let these bad things happen? And what we say is, well, we live in a sinful, broken world. And then we think, as our, and we're right, it is our job as Christians to try to help heal those things. The hurt that people feel, the, the diseases, the financial problems that people run into. We, wanna, we want the, the power of the gospel, the freedom in Christ, to physically help those people's problems and, and, and um, minister to them. And we try to bring hope and peace into those situations. But what about the hurt and pain and suffering that have been caused by our own history? Can we rejoice and seek justice and freedom for the rest of our neighbors and brothers and sisters in Christ? I want you to think about this because this is what has been on my heart and mind for more than a year now. So I just want to read a passage of scripture as we're going to close today. 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You know it very well. But I want to read it to you and think about what, I, what we have just talked about about how God has designed the body of Christ to work and think about maybe how we have not been so faithful and fruitful in doing that. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 12. This is not on the screen, just the reference. Verse 12 through 27. Paul writes this. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts, and though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And the parts that we think are less honorable, we treat with special honor. And the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our presentable parts need no special treatment. Here's the part I want you to see. But God has combined the members of the body and has given greater honor to the parts that lacked it. So that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. So that its parts should have equal concern for each other. So that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. We've tried to distance ourselves from suffering, right? Regardless of who it is, we don't want to suffer. Scripture says if one part of the body of Christ suffers, every part suffers with it. And if one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. What a fabulous teaching about the unity in the body of Christ that Paul has here. Now think about that in the context of the American church. You know, I think it was Martin Luther King who said the 10 o'clock hour on Sunday morning is still the most segregated hour of the day. It's probably still true. And I've shared with you my heart that I don't believe there is an African American church in New Haven. And how I would love for us to be that church or share or partner with somebody. Levi and I have talked about that on a number of occasions. And I don't know if God ever wants to do that, but I want the body of Christ to be unified, whether it's Hispanic or Burmese or African American, whatever it is that is close in our geographical area. If somebody who needs to worship together and be a part of the body of Christ, we want to be available and open to that. We want to suffer with the parts that suffer and rejoice with the parts that rejoice. So I just ask three quick questions as we leave this morning. Can we celebrate with the downcast and the brokenhearted? Can we identify with the needs of the poor? Can we celebrate with those who are in need of hope? Can we celebrate 
those whose freedom came on a different day than our own? To me, that's the question that I've tried to get at this morning. I mentioned earlier that we make the mistake have uh, Karen and Eileen come back. We're going to close this in a little bit. But I mentioned earlier that we make the mistake of thinking of white as American and American as Christian. And I would like us to fix both those things. Let me show you this statistic. This is from a tweet, but I also verified this because I couldn't believe it. The tweet says this. Africa is home to 27% of the world's Christians. 27%. The largest share in the world. There are more Christians in Africa than anywhere else in the world. Before that, that just happened in the past three or four years. Before that, it was Asia. The quote continues by uh, 2050, that figure will likely be 39%. Nearly 40% of Christians in the world will be in Africa. For comparison, the United States and Canada were home to just 11% of all the Christians in the world. Boy, have we made a mistake with our arrogance that America is white and America is Christian because it's other parts of the world that are even more so. Linda read to us Isaiah 61 this morning prophesying the Messiah. And now that he has come, that the Messiah has come, we are given that responsibility. It's a, it's a messianic prophecy in Isaiah. And now that the Messiah has come, he's left it to us to do what those verses say, to preach good news to the poor. To bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and release from darkness for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, to comfort all who mourn, and provide for those who grieve in Zion. That's our calling. We celebrate today not just independence and freedom, but we celebrate the gifts, we celebrate God's grace, we celebrate freedom. We celebrate our great God. Let's pray. Father, we are so thankful for the many privileges and blessings we have been given. Forgive us for our failures, for our avoidance, for our ignorance of the reality of our world for others around us. Some, Lord, sometimes we are just caught up in ourselves and our own history. We don't realize that you stooped down from heaven took on the form of a human, took on flesh to become like us, to identify with us in our sin. And we are so hesitant to do that for our brothers and sisters around us. Lord, as we celebrate this weekend, may we be more conscious and more aware of who we are, as not as Americans, but as your children, as your disciples, as your followers. Help us to be more faithful to that calling than to the, the love of patriotism. Lord, we do pray again for our country and our leaders that you lift them up, draw us as, as start with your church in reforming and, and renewing and reviving our country and making it to look more like you would have it to look. And as we rejoice and as we sing this morning, we look forward to a day when we will all be gathered together in the gates of glory, singing praises to you. And God's people said, Amen. I wanted to